Revelation chapter number 11. Begin reading verse number 14. It says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. <clears throat> and the seventh angel sounded. It's been a few chapters since we heard about them trumpets. But the seventh angel that had the seventh trumpet sounds here in verse number 15. It says, And there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and which wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Now, the seventh angel has sounded his trumpet, and then in verse number 15 it says that there were voices in heaven saying, it says there were great voices. Then in verse number 16 it says the four and twenty elders fell upon their faces and worshipped God, verse number 17 saying. In verse number 15 I don't know which voices are talking, but as soon as that trumpet sounds, great voices from heaven say the kingdoms of this world are become kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's not speaking in the first person. It does not say that, you know, if it was God speaking, right, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of me or my kingdoms. But I don't think that it's God saying it, but somebody in heaven had a cue card, several somebodies, and says they had great voices. And when that seventh trumpet sounds, they were to announce that the things that man thought were theirs, God's taken them. It says the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. He is announcing not only his intent, we know that he was coming back to rule and reign. This book tells us about the millennial reign. Right? We know that he's coming to set up his kingdom. They knew that before the New Testament was written. Did not Peter and some of his own disciples think that he had come to overthrow Rome, to set his people free from captivity and subjugation, that he was going to sit on the throne of David and reign when he came the first time? Did not people, when he borrowed a colt, and he rode into town, cast down palm leaves, and cried, Hosanna. They thought he was coming to reign then. They knew that God promised that one day, through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel, that it would be prophesied that through David, he would send another king greater than any other king, because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. We know that God promised that he intended to do it. But in this verse, these voices are not saying one day God's going to take over. The no, he's saying today is the day where the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. It says, and of his Christ. It doesn't just say that God's going to take possession. He tells you that the one who he sent the first time is the one that's coming back to gather up all those kingdoms and make them his. Now, if you study your Bible, you know that they are already his. Nobody comes to power without the Lord allowing it to be so. He already owned it. He's just showing up to take possession of it. Okay, that's the same thing as if you buy something online and you pick, pick up store, or store pickup. You bought it. You own it. But until you show up and claim it, you don't have possession of it. Ever since the Garden of Eden, God, and if you ask me why, all I can say is that His ways are above our ways and that He does all things well. 
But God allowed man's free will to reign upon this earth within limits. Whatever man desired to do, man could do with the condition that they would reap what they sowed. They were not without judgment. They were not without consequences. But God gave man ample time to use that free will and that measure of faith that he gave to everyone to exercise and to choose to exercise that faith and that free will to trust God. But today is the day where God says, it doesn't matter what your will is anymore. God's coming back. He's taken up those things which are His. And there's not a thing you can do to stop it. It says, and He shall reign forever and ever. There's your time period. When He comes back, how long is He going to be ruling and reigning? Forever. You ever heard of a word called eternity? That's how long. He already ruled and reigned, but now He's coming to set up His throne and make it known that He rules and reigns. Without doubt, without contest, without people that lie and blaspheme and degrade His name. He's coming and He's coming in flesh. His second coming. He's actually going to come to the earth. Rapture don't count. Why? Because we meet Him in the sky. The next time that He physically sets foot upon this earth, He reigns. He comes out of heaven with us on white horses. He's not coming temporarily. He's coming till the end. One day this world will be cast into the lake of fire. We'll get there eventually in this book. But heaven and earth shall be cast away. Why? Because he's got a new one. But as long as this one still exists, from the time that he comes back until the end, he's ruling and reigning over it. As is his right, because he created it. But it says in verse number 16, after that announcement was made, the four and twenty elders realize what's happening. Now, again, who's that four and twenty elders? Well, that's the twelve Old Testament patriarchs, and that's the twelve New Testament apostles. They've got seats before the throne of God. It says they fall off of their seats. They fell upon their faces and worshiped God. The twelve Old Testament patriarchs and the twelve apostles, what did they preach? They preached that God has a way, and at the end of that way, God has a lamb. One day that lamb is going to rule as a lion, lion of the tribe of Judah. And they preached, repent for the day of salvation is at hand. Repent because he's coming back. And they just heard that the day that they have preached about, the day that they instructed about, the day that they prophesied about, They've heard that that day is at hand and they fall on their faces before God and they worship God. Because everything that they desire, and truly, as a Christian, you desire for the Lord to come back and make things right. They know that God's plan has been completed. So many times throughout this book already, we saw the martyrs that were given white robes. They cried, Lord, how long will judgment be put off? God says, just a little time. There's still some out there who need to get in. But at this announcement, what God's saying is all things have been completed. It's time. Christ is coming back to set up His throne, and the four and twenty elders fall on their face, and they begin worshiping God. This is what they said. We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty. They're happy. They're thankful. This is true worship and that they're giving back to God and requesting nothing else. They're unreservedly worshiping God in spiritual bodies. Now they can worship God the way that they've always intended to worship God. They fall down and they say, Lord, we give thanks. Which are and must and are to come. 
because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. doesn't say will reign. It says hast reigned. That's past tense. See, God, being almighty, does it not say Lord God Almighty in all caps? You know what almighty means? He's got all might. But God, because he is God, could have chosen not to take all power. Right, we're getting into that spiritual realm that we don't know much about. God could have delegated power to many people or many things. But no, he kept it all, always. They're thanking God because he has taken to him his great power. For a time, God may have given man the illusion that man had power. They had deceived themselves. They believed the lie that they were the instrument of their own destiny. That if they believed it, that they could make it happen. Or that if they worked hard enough, they could change fate. There's only one thing that's certain, and that's death. You can't even say taxes nowadays because... Every now and then a country goes under and other countries have to bail them out. When countries are going bankrupt, not even taxes are certain anymore. But you ask Miss Billy, you get paid taxes here in a few months. Or are they going to come and get you? The only one thing that's certain from the moment you took your first breath, you knew that you had a last breath. But man believed that he could change that. There's still idiots out there today researching and looking into how to preserve the consciousness of a person after they die. There's a word for that. It's called a soul. And it's going to spend all of eternity in one of two places, heaven or hell. God always had all power. Just for a time, through grace and mercy... In long suffering, he chose not to exercise all the power that he had to give man a space of grace. Through seven dispensations, in seven different ways, God always made a way that man could find favor in the eyes of God. Because if he had exercised his power, God's power combats those things that are at enmity with God. You know what those things are? Sin. You know you were born into? Sin. If God had exercised his power that he's always had, then you wouldn't have had a chance to be saved. Because God's power would have annihilated sin. God's power would not have robed Adam and Eve in goat skin or in the skin of slaughtered sacrifices. God's power would have clothed them and robed them in judgment and wrath. God has always had all power, but on this day, He's going to start flexing a little bit. He's always had it. And it says in verse number 17, and hast reigned. Not a thing has happened that God Almighty has not permitted to happen. I firmly believe that every day the accuser of the brethren goes to God with machinations and designs on how he wants to destroy God's people for what we've been after we got saved. Not what you were before you got saved. He's bringing up stuff that you've done since you've been saved. And just like Job, God says, nope, can't have them. Hast thou considered my servant Job? The devil has no power. He has no reign. He's going to set up a throne. Guess what's going to happen to it? It's going to fall. Real power, according to this world, is being able to influence others' lives. Or having the ability to rule or to administrate over other people. That's not power. You know what that is? That's called high school games. It's just now there's money and countries and politics and everything else involved. You know what power is? The Bible put it this way. Who, with just a thought, can add a cubit to a stature? 
or could add one day to his lifespan. Real power is the ability to create and to destroy. We're pretty good at the destruction part, but that doesn't mean we have power. That just means we're good at breaking stuff. That's why you want me on the demolition team, not on the construction team. I'm real good at breaking stuff, not so good at fixing it. I'm a bull in the shiny shop. I don't mean to, it just kind of happened. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? God has the power to both create and destroy. As much as the devil wants to destroy a Christian, even if God delivered him into his hand, all he could do would be to end this mortal flesh. He can't destroy them. He has no power over their soul. But it says that he has to reign. They're saying, Lord, thank you for not taking a day off. Thank you for not giving a day to where one angel would rule in your stead. Thank you for not leaving man to his own devices. Thank you for sitting on your throne, having all power, and being an almighty God. Then it says, verse number 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. Why are the nations angry? Because they fought and they kicked and they tried their hardest. They put the smartest guys into a brain trust. And throughout all of man's history, you know what they keep coming to the determination of? We're not God. They keep trying to be. But they, every time they try to go out and do something new, they realize we're not God. Oh, they've made a lot. And they've used that intellect that God's given them to design and to think up wondrous things but at the end of the day they're wroth and they're angry why because they're not God and in all the times that the nations have come to that conclusion and people throughout all times and all places on the history of this globe they're without excuse to not admit that there is a God and that man is not him and because of their wrath, their pride, because of their desire to kick against the pricks, they continuously wounded themselves, but today God's coming in wrath, not in mercy. It says His wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants of the prophets and to the saints and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. These four and twenty elders are falling down before God and saying, Lord, thank you for the day that you're going to set everything right. Once and for all, the record books in heaven are going to be open. And man will see where they stand with God. Later on you're going to see that they're going to search the books. What are they looking for? God's approval and they're going to find out that it's not in there. The books are going to be open. We already talked about the judgment seat of Christ before we started. The books are going to be open and what's going to be in there? A record of the deeds that you did in your body after you got saved. There will be a great rewarding. He says, for the prophets and the saints, those that loved him, small and great. God's going to give the just due to those that loved him, that followed after him, that submitted themselves as his servants because they did not desire earthly things or things that they could see. They had a desire for things that were behind that veil in glory. Their heart was in glory, so they labored for glory. And then the Lord's going to present them with what they actually labored for. He said, you never saw these gold, silver, and precious gems. You may have gotten a hint of it every now and then, maybe a little glint from glory, when somebody that you witness to later walks an aisle and gets saved. Or that grandchild or that child or the spouse that you had prayed for for so long walks an aisle and gets saved. Or when you see somebody get victory over something when in secret you've been lifting them up in intercessory 
prayer and supplication in your own prayer closet and you see God deliver them from something. You may get a little glimpse of it every now and then. But that's just the earnest of what's really on the other side. When God truly reveals what it is, you've been, it'll be worth it all. Not because of what we get, but because of who's giving it to us. It'll be worth it all when we see Him. The icing on the cake is that He's going to say, here's what your labors for the Lord actually profited. And then, on top of that, the dessert to the cake is that you get to turn around and in reverence and honor and worship and love, lay those things back before Him and say, Lord, they were always yours. I was just the instrument that you used to get the job done. Lord, here's a token and a testament of my love and devotion to you. Here's how much I appreciated my salvation. I did these things not for me, but for you. Besides, what else could you want in heaven, really? You're a joint heir with him. Everything he owns, he, you own. What are you missing? You got it all. But they're saying, thank you for the day that there's going to be a rewarding. But then it also says that there's a day of reckoning. In the beginning of verse number 18, it says that his wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And then in the end of the verse it says, and should it destroy them which destroy the earth. There's three reckonings. The first is the reckoning of God's wrath. Man will have to stand before the righteous indignation of a thrice holy God. And let me tell you, they're not going to survive it. Then it's a day of the dead that they should be judged. That's their reaping what they've sown in this fleshly body. The first one. The second one is that they're reaping what they've sown in what? Their spiritual body. The day of the dead that they should be judged. Well, in order for the day of the dead, what's that mean? There's nobody left alive. All will stand before God on outer nothingness. And they'll receive judgment. That judgment, I dare say, because our God is a consuming fire, passing through that consuming fire of God's judgment, when presented with His holiness, and you have to stand before it on nothing, I dare say that that judgment will be a far less enjoyable experience than His wrath was. And then it says that He should destroy them which destroy the earth. Well, if the day of the dead has already happened, what's he talking about destruction? Well, that's that second death. He says, you took my creation, you perverted it, you destroyed it, you've exercised your will upon it, and he says, we're going to cast you into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And the earth's going with them. That is destruction. The first one was wrath. That's just giving them what they deserve. For what they've sown. Then they'll be judged in the spirit. And then they'll have to face the greatest of all terrors. Not death, the second death the death that even death itself fears. The one where you're cast into oblivion in the lake of fire. A place that when hell itself is cast into the lake of fire, it is consumed. He says, Lord, thank you for the day that all will once again be made right. And you know why they're thankful? Because it's that time according to the four and twenty elders. That seventh trumpet is blown. The day has come. Verse number 19 says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. How often does that happen? I don't know. I just know on this occasion, it was open. And then, 
that were seen in his temple, the ark of his testament. Know what that is? I do believe that that is the same thing that in the Old Testament they called it the Ark of the Covenant. Now there's a whole bunch of people today that are trying to figure out what happened to it, where it went, where it's hiding, what cave it's located in. I don't think they're going to find it. Because you know why it was created? Because God told them to make it. You know why they made it that way? Because God told them to make it that way with very specific instructions. You know what they put into it? Things that had God's fingerprint on it. Put a bowl of man in there. They took a rod that it actually bloomed. God touched it to where it had life in it. And then they had the remains of the tablets that Moses brought down off the mountain the first time that God physically had touched with his finger. Go study it. The first ones, he wrote on them with his finger through both sides. God touched it. It was different. It didn't make sense to man anymore because it says it was written through them. But that means you'd look at it and it looked like on this side it had one set of letters, but then you, you, know, you could see through the back. It was completely engraved through. But then you flip it over and the letters are different on the back side. How'd that happen? God touched it. It's different. It had been changed. Then there was a time that that ark represented God's presence among his people. It was literally a token of God's promise to Abraham and to his people. But for a time, God used it as a symbol of his presence among his people. It was oft said that an army that bore the ark before it could not lose. Well, that wasn't true. If God's people were right with God and they had the ark of the covenant with them, then they couldn't lose. But go see what happened to the Philistines when they tried to take it and make it one of theirs. Right? Disease and famine and everything else broke out. Why? Because it wasn't theirs. God gave it to Israel. But somewhere along the line... It was lost. The last recording we have, no one where it was, is when Solomon's temple was destroyed. But at a certain point, the ark was no longer needed to symbolize God's presence among his people. Why? Because Christ came. And then after Christ left, he sent the Comforter, the Holy Ghost to indwell his people God did away with the Old Testament economy but the reason that Israel lost the ark is because long before that God's people had lost God but God never lost his promise to them you say where where's it hidden at well a place that you can't see that you can't find that you're never going to why you say that, Brother Jordan? Because God took it back. If Israel would not be a protector of the promise that God made them, God would protect it himself. Amen. And by faith, they have to believe that God still keeps his promises. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And those 144,000 that are out in the wilderness that we keep referencing, we're going to get to them in the next chapter. But those 144,000, they've never seen the ark. They've never felt or seen the presence of God among his people. You know what they're living off of? Faith. You know why Israel lost the ark? Because they lost their faith. And God opens up the temple in glory and he says, Boys, it's time to fulfill that promise right there. That if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, repent, seek my face, that what? That he would deliver them, he'd restore them, he'd heal their land. Well, what do you think he's getting ready to do? Well, there's 144,000 out in the wilderness that have been seeking his face. 
They've humbled themselves and repented of everything that was before, and they've embraced what God always wanted them to embrace, Him. And they've been living on the Lamb, being hunted and persecuted and destroyed and devoured. And God opens up the temple in glory and He says, bring out the promise. Because Jesus is going to go collect those 144,000. And he's going to deliver them, literally, from the battle of Armageddon. But even when God opens up them doors and the temple, those doors, well, it says it was open. I don't even know that it's got doors. This is God's temple. It looks like whatever God wants it to look like. But it says that he opened it up. And John saw inside of it the ark of the testimony. Israel saw it as an ark of the covenant, the promise that God had made. God saw it as an ark of what? What he's done for God's people. It's a testimony of what God did for Israel. He made them a promise. And they saw the ark of the covenant as an ark or a picture of the promise that God had made to Abraham. God saw it as a list of things that he had done for Israel to make them his people. What did he do? He went and he called them. You think Abraham had ever heard from God before that day? I don't know. But he heard Abraham or Abram get up, go out, and in short, look for a city whose builder and maker is God. You know what he did? Just that. Every time that his faith was tested, he met the challenge, so to speak. And it goes so far to say that Abraham was the friend of God. We know that he's a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. But are we a friend to him? Abraham was. God made Abraham a promise. He said, out of you, I'm going to make many nations. Great. Now, your descendants will number more than the stars themselves. And Abraham says, okay, Lord. Even after that promise, you know what he was seeking? A city whose builder and maker was God. I believe he got a glimpse of it at one point when he ran into a fellow named Melchizedek. That's a whole different lesson for a whole different day. Do you think Abraham, who was the friend of God, was going to pay tithes to anybody else but God? Who did he tithe to the rest of his life? Melchizedek. Anyway. Whole point. That Israel saw it as a picture of that covenant. God saw it as a ark, a receptacle of the testimony of what God had done for Israel. When did they make it? They made it after God led them out of Egypt. What did they make it out of? Out of the spoils of Egypt that they carried out of Egypt. Why were they able to make it? Because God saw fit that while they were in Egypt that the best trained craftsmen were all Jewish slave boys. And they had the ability to not only make it, but to make it to where it would be an honor and an acceptable thing in the eyes of God. How did they make it? They made it based off of the blueprint that God gave them from heaven. And what did they put in it? Well, they put the tablets. God gave His people what God expected out of them. Now, with the New Testament, we know that, that those tablets were the beginning of what? The law. And the law was our schoolmaster to remind us of what? That we could not be God. We were nowhere close to becoming God. And that outside of God's grace and mercy and long-suffering, we could not find favor with God. Then what does he put in there? Aaron's staff which had budded to symbolize what? The Levites, the priests. 
throughout all of Israel's history, God would raise up a man to say what thus saith the Lord. He didn't always have one at every time, but when something needed to be said, it was said. And it was recorded and it was preserved. Why? So that the next generation could hear the same thing and know what God expects. But also the priests were those that were the overseers and the caretakers of what? God's house, His temple. In the wilderness is the tabernacle. Then, once the kingdom set up, they had a temple. Then they had the temple, Solomon's temple. The Levites were those that administered around the things of God. God entrusted His people with the maintenance of the things of God. Nowadays we hear about it in the perpetuity of God. God set up everything to where there would always be somebody that should have been there to continue on the things of God. He made provision for it. That it would last and it would endure. That something that was dead they were plucked up by the, twice dead by the root. They was in Egypt where once they were regarded as kinsmen and friends and they were able to live off of the Pharaoh's very own property. It was given to them. But at one point that turned to jealousy. Then jealousy turned to hatred. And then that turned into subjugation. And eventually they were defeated. They had no hope until God came and took something that was dead and He made it alive again in the wilderness. And He took a bunch of slaves and He turned them into what? A fighting army. Not because they knew how to fight, but because they knew in the one that had all power. That He went and He did many miracles before them to reveal that He was who He said He was. Why? So that they would have faith. That they would become alive. They wouldn't be defeated. That they had hope. But then, manna from heaven. Manna that should have, if you read your Bible, not keep till the next day. But yet it was preserved inside of that ark. Why? As a picture that God's always going to provide for those that depend upon Him. Does not this book bear witness that never seen the righteous forsaken? nor see what begging bread God always provides meets the needs of his people why because he promised to it's impossible for God to lie then after they got tired of food that came from heaven God started sending quails but it's a testimony of the fact that God never broke his promise it was Israel that had forgotten what God expected and because of that, they had to reap what they had already sown. You find people that are faithful to God through any point of this book, I'll show you somebody whose needs were met. And more than that, they had received blessings pressed down, shaking, and bubbling over. That they may have been poor in the eyes of this world, but they were rich beyond measure when it came to the things of God. And the testimony that's inside of that ark in God's temple, the testimony is that He is faithful and true. That God always fulfilled what He promised. Why does He open up the temple and show that? He's God. He doesn't need to prove anything to anybody. Why did He keep it? It's just some wood with some hammered gold finish on the outside of it. It's nothing compared to what God could have made Himself in glory. Why is it there? It's there to prove, not to anybody that's in heaven at this point, it's to prove to everybody down there in the world that He's getting ready to come back with and deal with it's to prove to them that if God says something, you can't change it. You know what land God promised to His people? Go study it. It's a whole lot bigger than what's outlined up there on that map. 
you go and study it out, but nowadays people will take a map of what is modern day Israel and they'll divvy it up into 12 portions. That's not what was promised to them. Everything from modern day Iraq to Egypt. Plus up and down. God promised it, and what's he doing? He's coming back and he's going to deliver it. Why all these wars in the Middle East? Because for generations they've been fighting whether it was Ishmael or Isaac that was the preferred and the chosen son. And they've been trying to erase God's fingerprints all over it of anything that he's ever done to prove that Israel's his people. Why is there all this fighting over in Israel right now? Because they're still upset over the fact that the world got together and said, well, it was theirs and we should give it back. And they were like, no, we got a whole bunch of countries now you just can't give it well, like, well we're definitely going to give them back Jerusalem and they said no they can't have that that's our holy city well, it's not you moved in and invaded it you overthrew everything that they had to set up what you wanted to put there every time there's a reminder that God's got a chosen people what's the world try to do they try to wipe them off the map God said I've got an ark of a testament of everything that I ever did for them, everything I ever promised to them. He says, and I'm bringing it back just to remind the rest of y'all that if I promised it, you can't undo it. Because he's coming back for the last 144,000. They've done everything that they can to wipe them out. And God's coming back and saying, uh-uh. I promised I'd always have a remnant. And here's a proof of everything I've already done. And you're getting ready to see what I'm about ready to do. And notice the effect of the revealing of the ark. It says, And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Just bringing up that God's got the ark of the testament. Causes this world to go nuts. It says lightnings, voices, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. You go study it out. We don't have time. All those things that he just listed, they're the same tools that God's been using from the beginning to bring judgment and wrath upon the world. Earthquakes, voices, lightnings, hail. They're natural phenomenon that man has no control over. And just at the very mentioning that God's coming back, the earth gets a little bit excited. He's coming back to set everything right. The world had a little bit of a case of the can't help it right here, as our pastor would say. They hear he's coming back. And it's crying for him to come back. Doesn't your Bible say that the rocks cry out in our stead if we don't praise them? Doesn't your Bible say that the earth groans for the return of its creator? Well, when he brought out the ark again, the earth knew he'd coming back. He made us. And for a while, he walked on the earth with us for about 33 and a half years. But now he's coming back to set up full reign. Because even the earth knows that the Prince of Peace shows up, there's going to be peace again. Even the earth itself longs for God's peace. And when he says, bring out the ark. You know when they would bring out the ark from the tabernacle in the Old Testament? either when they were moving to a different place and they were putting the ark first so that God would lead them or if they went to war. The trumpet sounds that the cavalry's coming and God says, go get the war banner. What is it? It's the ark. And the earth hears that he's coming back. Heard the trumpet, heard that he went and got the ark again the earth gets a little happy and it's saying to all these people that are trying to destroy it from verse number 18 
y'all ain't got any idea what's about ready to happen. Because believe it or not, the earth was there and heard him when he said, let there be light. Because long before he said, let there be light, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters of the earth. And the earth hears that he's coming back and it gets a little excited. And it starts letting loose a few amens and hallelujahs and glory to God. Because I can assure you that there's been very little praise and worship through these seven years that we've been reading about. And the earth and the rocks are opening up and crying and offering praise to God that He remembered His promise and that He's coming back. It's looking forward to the millennial reign where there's going to be peace for a thousand years. Where everything will be in order again as it was at the beginning. The earth desires God to come back more than some Christians desire God to come back. Because the earth remembers what it was to live in perfect harmony with God, its creator. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.